Chapter 4 deals with marketing on the web. <clears throat> and this is really just kind of a high level uh, emphasis on some of the key marketing principles working on the web. Uh, we also offer an entire course on marketing in general that goes into much more depth of each of these aspects of marketing. Uh, but it's <clears throat> useful to take a look at this and see specifically with our e-commerce, what are the marketing principles we have to be uh, concerned about and you know what are the tools we have to use. So one of the first things you find is, and this is common language in marketing, the four P's of market, product, price, promotion, and place. And the book goes into good discussion on that as to what those entail. They're pretty uh, descriptive of themselves as to what are, you know, what are the four P's and how does that, you know, facilitate and encourage. Ultimate goal is to make a transaction. You want your site visitor to become a customer that purchases your products or services. Now, as we look at marketing, one of the key concepts is this idea of market segmentation. It's completely impractical and too costly to try and market to every single person on the earth. We don't want to market to someone that has no need for our products. In a perfect world, we would market to each person as an individual, but there's just no way to do that. So the best that we can do is to group people together that have similar characteristics that may share the same wants and desires. It's a generalization. And one thing that is true with generalizations is that they are never accurate. There's always going to be the exception. Somebody that fits all these specific attributes, you group them together with someone else and they have completely opposite tastes, purchasing practices, uh, whatever. So just understand that's the limit of market segmentation, but it does allow us to focus on a group of people <clears throat> and to utilize the limited marketing resources that we have. Marketing is expensive. And so we want to use those limited resources that we have in the most efficient way we can that produces the most likely result we're looking for. So market segmentation just divides the total potential customer pool into segments that are defined by specific customer characteristics that we can easily measure. And you hear the term micro marketing. It's just when you get down to very small segments of the market, some really large categories when we're talking about market segments, <clears throat> geographic segmentation, where you're marketing to the United States or your marketing to England or your marketing to Brazil and you're basing your marketing approach on the geographic location and yes you can do that with uh, the internet it knows where that computer that is accessing your website what country it has come from so you could specify different ads different promotions based on the person's IP address that is accessing your website. Demographic segmentation, these are characteristics that we have. You know, ethnicity, gender, you know, a lot of things that are just, those are the demographic segmentation. And then you get into psychographics. I always like the term psychographic. Sounds like, you know, some uh, psychedelic drug. But really, that's referring to behaviors. So people who are outdoor enthusiasts, uh, people who you know like live concerts, people who enjoy sports. And believe it or not, Google knows 
where you fit in all of those. Based on your web browsing, it has built a dis digital dossier about you, and they infer things about you, things like gender, income, political affiliation, <clears throat> lifestyle, you know, outdoors, you know, sports, all those things they can infer based on your past browsing history. And so, of course, if you have more than one person that uses the same computer, it can kind of get a little mixed up because it's all it's seeing is the computer IP address. It doesn't know that there are multiple people using that. But as more and more people have their own individual devices, you know, for example, smartphones, they know that that's tied to a specific individual, probably not multiple people using a smartphone browsing the internet. So what this does is it gives us the opportunity to provide a different experience online depending upon who you are. So if coming in from your IP address, Juicy Couture identifies you as a young fashion conscious buyer, they can display their information in a way that is appropriate to you. Whereas another website like Talbot's could tailor their display based on, again, they're inferring how old you are, you could have multiple versions of the same website. You could have different ads depending upon the demographics and the psychographics of the person coming to your web. Uh, you know, you, you know, even based on geography, maybe you have a different rebate offer for people in the US and it's not valid in uh, England and so you don't even show it if the person is coming to visit your site from England. Restore, retail stores, you know, you've got a display space and so you put forth a single message. The beauty of the web is that we can change whatever ad we're showing. We don't have to be stuck to just one. We can change it constantly. We can easily update it. You know, we can have daily ads and daily specials, all kinds of flexibility built into that. And as I was mentioning before, you can really have your website behave differently depending upon the segmentation that you choose. If there's no difference in how the people behave, then there's no point in having them in different segments. So when you look at the parameters when you're doing your market segmentation, you need to not over segment it. You know, if teenagers behave basically the same as young adults, then you don't need to have two separate categories for them. Now, the interesting thing is, after we do all that analysis, and so we've got this person figured out, except the same person may require different products and services depending upon the occasion. So this idea of behavioral segmentation is that you create separate customer experiences based on their behavior. And this typically is the kind of thing that is a reoccurring activity that occurs based on the calendar. It could be universal. Right around Valentine's Day, you know you're going to probably treat everyone differently than you're going to treat them after Valentine's Day. You know there's a event in the calendar that you know requires you to adjust your approach to different customers. So anyhow, it's just to be aware, we also have to take that in mind that 
that what we need as consumers changes throughout the year. And really, this the author makes a good statement here. In the online world, it is much easier to have something that adjusts the experience to meet different customer needs, customer behavioral modes. And that's really what we're looking to do, is to customize the visitor experience to match what's best for them. Now we're going to look at a few categories ways that you could think of your potential customers one is I like you know this this is the browser they just like to come and look at sites no nothing in particular in mind they're just looking to see oh what are you guys up to now you can have specific things that you do to try and prompt those browsers to stay and look further at your products a lot of times I've seen things where when I'm okay I've looked at it and then I click to go to another website and I'll get a little window it says are you sure you want to leave um, I've got a new article here that you may be interested in uh, why don't you check this out before you leave so you have some thing there to try and trigger people to spend more time on your site to get more engaged with you. Those visitors that develop a favorable impression with you are more likely to, the key there, bookmark the site. So they say, you know, I'm not ready to buy something today, but I want to save this and come back to this at a later date. So another category are the people who are ready to buy something. They're ready to make the purchase right now. What's key in that case is that the, your website should make a very easy way to get to the, you know, finding the products, adding the products to the, the shopping cart and checking out. Don't require people to create an account. Allow them if they want to, to just be a guest making a purchase. You know, if someone is really interested in your company, they will create an account, but don't force them to create an account just to buy your stuff. Make it as easy as possible for them to click, you know, make the purchase now. This is one key thing, the page. When you get to the shopping cart and you're ready to check out, oh, shoot, there's something else I wanted to get. Now, how do I get back to shopping? Have an easy to find link right on there that you know is labeled something like continue shopping or whatever. Also have a link that allows them to say, you know, I'm still interested in this, but I'm not quite ready to buy it yet. You know, a button that's maybe something like save the cart for later or something like that. So it keeps it there for them. Because the primary goal with these buyers is you want to allow them to complete that transaction as quickly as possible. But as I said, you also want to allow for the fact that they're saying, uh, I don't have time to finish right now. There's someone at the door. Um, oh, I'm running late. I got to get to another meeting, whatever. Give them an easy way to sh save their shopping cart or an easy way to go back and add additional items to the shopping cart. Shoppers are another category. So they're kind of in between browsers and buyers. They're motivated and looking for more information. They want to make a purchase, but not quite yet. So what's important to these people is they need the comparison tools. They want to look at product you know, one compared to product two compared to product three. And so those side-by-side -side comparison is a great tool. In order to do that, you need to make sure all of your inventory has adequate attributes associated with it and that the attributes are consistent. So if I 
select three different brands of refrigerator. They all have the same specifications listed to them so they can be displayed side by side so I can make an easy comparison. Having product reviews is great. You know, people like to look and see, well, what have others said? Even though we know <clears throat> if someone is unhappy with a product, they're more likely to post a negative product review and to exaggerate. People who are satisfied with their products are less likely to post a product review at all. And if they do decide to post it, they're more likely to post maybe they understate it. You know, they don't give it five stars because, you know, five stars, that has to be really exceptional. But I'm completely satisfied, so I'll give it a three or four. Where someone who's unhappy with a product is going to give it a one and is going to blast it in the, um, the text of their review. So when you see a product has, wow, you know, 15% of the people reviewing it gave it a one and only 5% gave it a five star, you know, that's because most people who really, if you'd ask them, would say it's a five star, didn't bother to take the time to post. So as consumers, one day we're a browser, we return sometime later, maybe that same day, maybe a week later, as a shopper looking for some more details, and then maybe a month later we return, okay, I'm ready to make a buy. So the key there is that the behavior categories are you know, not retained from one visit to the next. You know, people are different. So you need a way of quickly ascertaining based on what they're clicking on saying, aha, we've got a shopper or we've got a buyer. So you can make sure your website flows easily for them. Now there is another uh, alternative way of looking at your website vis visitors. McKinsey has listed here, you know, simplifiers surfers, bargainers, connectors. And again, the reason for doing that is this next chart where we indicate these groups of people, these characteristics, what are they trying to accomplish when they come online? And what are the website characteristics that will attract these you know, visitors? So it's important to think that way, to say, okay, if I've got a bargainer, Pretty obviously, they're looking to find a good deal. So what is going to track them? You know, auctions, discounts, coupons. You know, when I'm looking at Amazon on some products and I see, oh, wow, this product has a 10% off discount associated with it. I'm more likely to zero in on that and say, oh, maybe this is the one I want. I was kind of thinking about that other product, but this one has a discount. You know, some people really like to think they're not paying full price for something, that they're getting a deal. When we talk about putting ads on websites, and this is a really sensitive area. You really have to balance it. You don't want a bunch of ads on your website. A few ads, okay, but don't overwhelm your website with ads. People don't appreciate ads very much. There are some standards if you're going to be doing some web-based advertising as to what the size should be, and that's what the author shows. Here he gives you four of the standard ones. It's not all inclusive. There are other sizes that you can have to for doing your web ads. It really depends on you know some of the characteristics of the website you're putting them on, what space they reserve for ads. But let's talk a little bit more about ads, and in particular some intrusive ad formats. When we talk about intrusive ads, the first thing that comes to mind, pop-up windows. And these are, I would say, annoying is an understatement. 
people just don't like the fact they came to this website for a reason and bing there's something you know blocking me from being able to read the full page and you know just get it out of my way really irritating another similar uh, activity is what's called an interstitial ad and so when you click to bring up a web page instead of loading the web page that you thought you were going to instead it first brings up its own page and it may go away automatically or you may have to close it to get it out of the way but they're they're bigger pop-up only covers part of the screen this takes over the whole screen and so they're even more annoying than pop-up ads. Fortunately for us consumers, most browsers have add-on modules that can allow you, or it's built into the browser to allow you to block, you know, pop-up ads, or in some cases block all ads from loading. And so, realize that even if you pay for an ad it doesn't mean people are going to see it because there are ways of preventing it from happening so bottom line what you should do don't do pop-up ads or interstitial ads all they do is irritate people they do not drive business just don't do it now there are some other ad formats you can do instead of a, a graphic or a written ad like that is you can have video ads. But again, this should be, I would say, off to the side, down to the bottom, out of the way of the main screen. This activity that the you know the that it floats over the web page itself, you know, that's kind of like a pop-up ad. If I want to watch a video, I'll click on it. So make it out of the way. You can make it, you know, obvious that it's there, but keep it out of my way so that I don't have to watch it. One of the problems with video ads is they can take a lot of bandwidth. And remember, not everybody in this country, and certainly not everyone in the world that may be coming to your website not everybody has high-speed broadband uh, internet access so never 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 under any circumstances if you have a video ad on your website never make it auto start make it to where it only starts if someone wants it to you don't want to suck up a bunch of bandwidth loading a video that the person is not interested in to begin with so again be respectful of people. Text-based ads, you know, short message, no graphic elements. Google found that when you do just a text-based ad like this, it's less obtrusive than ads with images, but it's still quite effective. One of the things though that Google did get in trouble with is not being clear in indicating that the text that's being shown is an actual ad it's not a piece of news it's not a fact it's an ad so they do label them now um, you know paid content you know other indications to clue you in that this is an ad uh, let's see anything interesting let's go on to cost effectiveness you know, it's it's always true. Even before web advertising, when we're talking about print advertising, management at the company I worked for always wanted to know what are we getting for all this money we're paying for in marketing and advertising. So you do want to track how much you're spending on online advertising and come up with a way of measuring. So how effective is that? One of the ways you do that is by the advertising that you do on other people's sites or whatever. You point them to a special link on your website. Now, the link that you point them to may have an auto redirect so that it immediately takes them to your home page. So that as far as the 
consumer is concerned, they clicked on that link and it took you to the home page. But because it first went to a different page, with Google Analytics, you can see how many people came to your website because of the link in that ad. So you can, you can track and see how much traffic are you driving. And then you can make that decision. Was it worth it? Did we achieve the number of new visitors to our website from that ad? So again, come up with a metric. You have to have some way of measuring it to, to determine, is this working for us? If it's not, try something else. It might be the ad that's the problem. Maybe it needs to be changed and reworked. It might be the website that you're on does not have the, the type of uh, consumer that you're looking for. And then things that you'll hear, you know, the pricing metric, you know, you can have the cost per, you know, in this case per thousand, that's per thousand views as opposed to cost per click. And the difference is with the cost per views, you're being charged by how many people visited a website that was displaying your ad. Whether they ignored it or clicked on it doesn't matter, just the fact that they saw it. Whereas the cost per click is only if someone actually clicks on the link do you get charged. Of course, um, the best ones are the cost per click. Because you know those, you know those people, by their very action, have expressed an interest in your company, your product. So that's a warm sales lead. When you just throw it out to everyone and you don't know who your customers are, you go with the number of views, and they're priced differently when you place the ads, depending upon how well you understand the demographics of your target market will determine which version is the most cost effective for you. Uh, let's see. Anything interesting on here? Uh, no, we already talked about that, so let's move on. So email marketing. I like the, the top here. It can be a powerful element of your advertising strategy to let people know about new products or special sales. The problem is it, this down here, the unsolicited commercial email, spam. You don't wanna do that. Just do not get involved in that. Only send out your email marketing to people who have said they want it, they're interested in it. So the key to not getting engaged in, sp in spam, it's very simple. Only send it to people who have asked for it. Now, what privacy advocates will talk about, there's a preferred way of doing this. It's called the double opt-in. So I find your company's website and there's a link there, clicks to sign up for the newsletter. So I click on it, I give you my email address, great. With double opt-in, the company will then turn around and send me an email saying, hey, thank you for requesting our newsletter. To confirm that you want to receive this, please you know, click on the link below. And so then I click on it, say, yes, I really want it. So I have re I have told them twice now that I want their newsletter. And the reason it's important to do that second one is sometimes people inadvertently request something. They clicked on the wrong button or they didn't notice that the default on the checkbox was sign me up for the newsletter, any number of reasons. And you don't want that person, when you send them a newsletter, you don't want them saying, hey, I didn't request this. What are you guys doing? That's a negative image on your, your company. But the other reason that you want to do the double opt-in is that there were some issues with people 
who got angry and mad at someone and if they knew that other person's email address they could go to a bunch of websites maybe some of them inappropriate websites and say sign me up for the newsletter because if they've got your email address they just put your email address in then and they sign you up for 30 different newsletters and all of a sudden you're getting all this junk in your inbox with the double opt-in you would get an email from each of those 30 companies saying hi please confirm you want the newsletter and you'd say no I did not request it and then it's done so use the double opt-in uh, let's see and I just talked about the process of opt-in uh, you can use companies like Constant Contact, Yes Mail, uh, Chimp Mail's another one for managing your email strategy, and they have built into their their product and their services the opt-in and the opt-out features. You know, and they'll track everything for you, and really quite, uh, you know, it, it's it's quite affordable. It's not expensive at all. I've used constant contact with a couple of companies uh, that I was involved with and they're very affordable now one thing the author talks about is the idea of using technology you know with a CRM system and the CRM stands for customer relationship management and the idea there is that we need to make it interacting with our company more personal we don't want people to feel like just a number we can't get the face-to-face -face handshake you know experience that you get in a brick and mortar store but we can do some things to lessen that uh, you know that a person feels like they're just a number in the system and what a CRM system does is it keeps track of everything we know about that person so that when you call in or you do an online chat or you go to the shopping cart it remembers aspects about you and that can make it easier for the customer to do business with us and that's the goal we want to make it easy and enjoyable to do business with us it's like on my amazon account if i go oh i need to order another one of those widgets and i go what the heck was that called i can quickly look at all my past orders to see ah there it is that's the one Amazon also uses that information to make suggestions to me as I mentioned earlier uh, they might suggest hey we see that you've been ordering this item every three months why don't we set you up on a subscription basis so by tracking everything we know about the person, it can make a lot easier. It makes it easier for tech support too. When you're calling in on something and say, yeah, I, you know, I've got a problem with the, the modem I bought from you. And they're looking at your orders and saying, and you see, oh yeah, I see you bought that uh, last December. Uh, that's a good model. What's going on? You know, so they can bring up your account very quickly. Okay, password. The password for chapter four quiz is SEO, all capital letters, which stands for search engine optimization, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So again, if you need to pause this video to get a paper and pen, otherwise I'm going on to talk about search engine optimization. <clears throat> so when we're talking about this there are so many websites out there how do people find your website any number of ways a friend can refer your website say hey you got to go check out xyz.com you can have a link on a website that's referring either a paid advertisement link or it can be a website that says uh, you know if you're interested more in this you should go check out this company they've got some great articles you can have your URL your website name in 
print advertisements, television, other things where people have seen it. The key there is whatever your website name is needs to be easy to remember. So here in the Portland area, we have a jeweler and the name of the jeweler is the Shane Company. So you can certainly remember Shane.com. That's a pretty easy one to remember. And so even if I heard their ad on the radio while I'm driving and I don't have time to write it down, I can probably remember that. So one of the keys you want when you're creating your website name, it needs to be something that's easy to remember or a name that clearly reflects your products and services. As we'll see here in a minute when we look at the most expensive uh, you know, URL domain names that have uh, been sold, you know, hotels.com is one of them, okay? Hotels.com tells me, you know, I want to get a hotel. I'm shopping for hotels. So the name is very synonymous with the function of my company. Another way that people end up on your website or conversely on someone else's website is if they made a typing mistake, you know, if the common spelling of the name you used in your website has two S's, but for whatever reason you chose to only put one S in your name, people are going to mistype it and they'll either get a page not found or they end up going to some other completely different website. You might want to think about when you look at that, if there are some common alternate spellings to the sound of your company's name, you might want to see if you can buy up those alternate spellings on the company's name so that if someone does make a typing mistake, it gets automatically redirect, redirected to your main site name and it's invisible to the customer. What you don't want them to do is going to someone else's website and then getting frustrated, you know, and going someplace else. Or worse yet, they get the page not found and they're going, oh, I guess that company went out of business. No, they didn't go out of business. You just didn't type in the address correctly. And of course, I would say more common is that the way people find you is they do a search in, search on the some attributes of your either your company name or the products or services that you offer and so that's what we're going to look at now is if someone uses a search engine you know what you know how can we be found when someone uses a search engine since that's probably the way most of your traffic comes to your website now again with google analytics it will tell you how did someone arrive at your website was it a link from another site? Was Did they type in the site name directly? Or did they find uh, it through a search engine? So one of the terms you'll hear is spider. This is a program that goes out and searches the entire internet and it rotates through how they scan to find all the different sites you know on every uh you know every so often the spiders will cycle through all the possible websites that are out there on the internet and as they go to each website they're looking for keywords on your various web pages and they're tracking those they're collecting those keywords to try and develop you know their own understanding of what your website is about and they save that information and then when you type in search terms looking for some company product or service it goes out to the database and it looks to see okay what are the websites that had the most uh, instances of those particular keywords and then there it's a very complex algorithm that google and others use to determine of all those literally millions of websites that match the terms that you typed in 
what are the first 10, the 10 that, the, that they think are most likely to be what you're looking for that they will put on that first page of search results. And so it is, uh, as I said, they have a complex ranking system to decide what appears there. So the concept of search engine optimization is there are some things that we can do that will more likely get our pay our website on that first page. There's a large number of people that only look at the first page of searches. And so if your company shows up on the second or third page of those search results, a lot of people are never going to find you. So what are some things that you can do? And there are companies out there that all they do is they consult with you as to what you can change, keywords you can add to your website, uh, external uh, you know, links to your website, things you can do to maximize the likelihood that you will appear on that first page. It's part art and part science, and it's way more involved than you want to get into. So I know, especially as a startup e-commerce company, you're going funds are limited. You know, I'll just do the SEO myself. Forget it you need to pay a little bit of money and have a professional help you with your SEO. It, it's not, you don't want to spend the time and effort to try and become an expert at SEO, uh, you know, cause it has a big impact. It will, you know, a well done site that has been optimized will generate a lot more income than if you try and do it yourself. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, paid placement if you advertise with Google oh guess what you get preferential treatment and so you might think say well okay I'll, I'll advertise with Google you have to have a pretty big checkbook to have it make any difference when I was at Tyco Electronics a multi-billion dollar company I looked at improving our search engine ranking by doing advertising with Google and they wanted so much money I said forget it I'm not going there so you can also buy some display ad space but again it's expensive so as I reiterated again here it's a complex subject you know rely on a consultant to help you figure out what's best for your company so let's talk about your website name for a minute. And the reason this is important in this whole chapter on marketing is if people can't find your website, if they can't remember your website name, doesn't matter how good your marketing is if people can't find you. So you really want to think about that what is going to be the name that people use you know for your to find your website it's one of the hardest things when setting up a new company is coming up with a good name that is not already taken and so think about it and again like the author says here you would like it to be closely associated with the company name. So I suggest when you're choosing a name for your company, you put you might have what you think is a really cool name. Put that on hold. First, go and look and see is the URL, is the website name available. If it isn't, think about some other names for your company till you find one where the, the website name, the URL is available. So you can have your company name and your website name very closely associated. Be careful with your domain names. I like this. Um, I fly SWA. That's what they originally thought for Southwest Airlines. They found that wasn't working. And so they went to Southwest.com was much more intuitive 
And I think it's interesting the authors, the second example they get is also an airline. Instead of Delta dash air, it's much easier to be just delta.com. <clears throat> and I mentioned this earlier that you will buy multiple domain names, misspelled words. You may um, have a unique brand within your company. And so maybe you want to also buy the, the website name that's just that brand. Think about all the different ways that a customer might want to try and find you with the names. And if those URLs are available, buy them. Uh, a lot of times you're only talking about 10 or 15 dollars a year for a website name. The key is it's better for you to purchase those than your competition. You know, if your competition looks and sees that um, you spell your name, most people would spell it with an S, but you spell it with a Z. And they look at it and see, oh, gee, the one with the S is available. I'll just buy that and I'll have it direct to my website. And so now people that make a typing mistake on your website name end up being directed to your competition. So it's better for you to spend the money and buy up those misspellings, uh, especially if they're common words. Just go ahead and do it. So for example, here's another one. Art you frame. When they decided to change it to art.com, they got a 30% increase in traffic the very next day. That's a big deal. And then ultimately, for whatever reason, they went out of business. But another art company who purchased that domain name, they saw a 100% increase the first month. So art.com is a pretty good name to have if you're in the, the art industry in some fashion. You know, there's, uh, you know, I can't emphasize too much how important a good domain name is. And to go show you on the next slide how important it is for some domain names, how expensive they can become. Now, for your company, and if you're careful about picking domain names that other people haven't used or wanted you can get them for very inexpensive but if you go with a more generic uh, name that could apply to multiple people like hotels.com they can get very expensive so how expensive oh here's the list that sold for more than five million dollars for a particular domain name big money like I said, for most of us, we set up our business name. It, you know, registering that site, it's going to be less than 100 bucks, oftentimes less than 20 You can sell or even lease domain names. So if someone contact you have a domain name that you're not using someone might contact you and say hey are you interested in selling it you can say yeah i decided i'm not going to use that after all sure i'll be glad to sell it how much will you give me or you could say yeah i don't need it right now but i might need it in the future so i'll lease it to you for oh well, let's say let's do three years because i'm pretty sure i won't need it for at least three years I had a domain name reserved. I thought I was going to do something with it and it sat there for a couple years. I hadn't got around to going down that project after all. And this was a personal, um, you know, it was a family name website kind of, you know, that I had reserved. And I got contacted by someone who says, hey, are you interested in selling it for $800? And since I wasn't planning to use it, I said, uh, sure, especially since I'd only paid $7 for it. So it's, it's like anything. It's uh, supply and demand. If somebody really wants your domain name, 
they'll offer accordingly. Um, let's see. Anything I wanted to say about that? No, I think that pretty much covers it. So there we have it. That's marketing on the web. Like I say, there's a lot more involved in marketing in general than what is covered in this chapter or I've covered in this lecture. Make sure you take a full-blown marketing class because that's going to really help you in your e-commerce is having a solid understanding of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to marketing.